often argue that good economics makes bad politics and good politicians make bad economics. So it's a true delight today to discuss India's politics and India's policies uh, with a politician, with an economist and a political scientist uh, to really unravel whether we are out in the middle and what the intersections truly are between politics and economics. My own suspicion is good politics and good economics mix really rather well and I suspect we'll all collectively come to that conclusion over the next half an hour. Uh, when you think about the current policy juncture that India is in, uh, I think one does get a sense of, a, of an economy, a polity and a society that is in the midst of a really important transition. A transition that began in 1991 uh, with a, a significant radical shift in our economy. But uh, having arrived through a period of decades of rapid growth, uh, at, a, at, a, at a critical juncture, one where critical questions confront us in terms of the pathways of economic growth that we have adopted, uh, the extent to which the project of reform uh, still needs completion, but big burning questions about whether the narrative of reform as it was uh, in fact addresses the current conundrums that we face today. Conundrums of inequality, uh, rapid economic growth has meant a substantive increase in incomes across the board, but a significant increase in income of the top 1% with a huge gap and bottoming out of the bottom percent, uh, uh, of, of, of the bottom of the income um, uh, growth. Changing geoeconomics and geopolitics as we talked about in the session earlier, placing very important questions on what our economic pathway should be and also a fairly significant shift in our politics. I think uh, we are coming out of an election uh, which, uh, where, where the Bharatiya Janata Party has now got a, a resounding mandate, uh, one that fundamentally alters uh, the power structure and the politics, and how these two intersect are going to shape the future of our economic trajectory as we confront larger global problems like climate change and the environment. Pathways we adopted in 1991, uh, are they still relevant for India uh, in the context of the changing global dynamics and changing needs of India uh, and the big conundrum of inequality? Let me begin with you, uh, Dr. Akesh Mohan, first, just to give us a sense. Uh, these days, when you pick up the newspapers in, uh, in India, the first thing you get to read about is the economic slowdown. Uh, and the big question to my mind is whether the current policy challenge we face is that one of a cyclical challenge we face that is that, that, that is of our present making that can can be at, uh, arrested with, uh, with 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 policy changes, or is there something deeper and more structural in terms of the particular economic moment that India is confronting? Is this challenge one of unfinished reforms of 1991 that we need to see through to their logical conclusion, or are there deeper structural questions that the policy making community needs to be asking about itself? Before I come to your exact uh, question, I first say that as someone said in the morning and you someone referred, that, that India has really got truly transformed in the last 35 years or so, or now 28 years since 1991. And uh, I mention this because there ought to be confidence that if we could use, we, we could change course then and continue the serial reforms for 25 years and really change the country, that should encourage us and give us confidence that we can continue doing that. And again, to put that in context, that we have to remind ourselves that, as I again mentioned in one of the last sessions, that our per capita income is still only $2,000 per capita. We must keep reminding ourselves it's only $2,000. China is $9,000. Thailand is six or 7000 so we have absolutely no time to do it. Even if we grow at 7% a year, we'll only be 8,000 20 years from now. In 20 years from now, we will be less than China is today. And I want to mention this because it should give us a sense of urgency. That look, we can't have business as usual. And now to come to your point, I do believe it's not a cyclical slowdown. Um, last six years of school have not been good. Growth in exports of goods 2012 to 18 has was zero. Not one, two, three, four percent, it was zero. 2012 to 2018, 
you will get up to 2018, 19. Uh, I don't want to go through all of those things, but to, there is just to make one, one indicator that all is not well. And we should, first thing is, we have to recognize that. But at the same time, we should have the confidence that look, we've done things before, we've changed before, and therefore we need to put our heads together now, not to do incremental changes, but to really do the And in that context, um, one of the puzzling things has been that when we did the 1991 reforms, we were really focused on industry and manufacturing. One thing that's one thing that's not responded well enough to all the reforms that we've done is industry manufacturing. So that the weight of manufacturing in the GDP remains the same as it was, maybe slightly lower than 25 years ago. So number one, we really have to concentrate our attention on manufacturing. Number two, I mentioned export particularly. No country in the world which has grown at 7% plus for 20, 25, 30 years has grown without major growth in exports. We had that from 2002 to 2012. Our export growth rate from 2002 to 12 was not very different from that of China. Growth rate at the level. Therefore, we can do it again. But to grow from 0 for 6 years, growth rate to again 8, 10, 12 percent, you have to change. One important point in that respect, and this goes back to the discussion on the geopolitics, uh, um, is that some of the projections suggest that, that the weight of Asia and the global economy is going to surpass the US and China, the US and Europe combined for the next 20 years or so. Other projections suggest that the incremental growth in GDP in the next 15 years in the world is going to be higher than the last 15 years. And, for, and second, that the, that the incremental growth in demand for goods in the next 15 years is going to be higher than the last 15 years, but almost all of it coming from Asia. And therefore, the point is that in, from the Indian point of view, we really have to consider manufacturing and export, export of goods, and really look much more towards Asia. We've been used to looking to the West when we are sitting today. The future is not here. The future is in China, which people don't like. But the future is in China, India is in the middle. We have to we have to do a path which is very careful because we need of course to have to, to be in the US as well. But we can't be with the US vis a vis China. The, the future of the world, as far as the economy is concerned, is Asia. And among other things, for example, 65% of all patents today are produced in China. Let me repeat, 65% of all patents produced today are in China. Uh, so there's a huge amount of technical research, scientific activity also going on in Asia. And one of the things we need to do among reforms, for example, is really concentrate on single higher education. I think I saw a report today, which was yesterday, or before yesterday, that there's not one in university in the top 300 in the world. There's no way you can grow at 7 10 percent if you have not one university in the top 300. Given the amount of uh, brain power among India that exists in the world, there's no reason why you shouldn't have five universities in the top 100. And therefore, I've not gone into the details of what we need to do, because I think that's just too much. My point is that the government, the country as a whole, has to once again, which it has not been doing for the last six years, last seven years, to really resolve the look, the first thing, the first number one priority is growth, despite what you're saying about inequality. I'm not saying don't look at inequality. Among the big failures we've had in the last seven years is health and education. Absolutely. And therefore, we, and, but to grow also, we need much greater investment in health and education. But number one priority has to be come back to growth. We can be nowhere in the world, we can be nowhere in Asia, we can be nowhere compared to China. Unless we resume growth of seven to nine percent a year for the next twenty years, and then decide on what how we go over that. And I can later on, you guys can me talk about what what to do. But I want to, be, to to really give the message that we have forgot. If you look at documents in the last six seven years, growth has not been the number one priority, and it has been historically that way. 
Mr. Mr. Chokri, well, I have to come to you with this As <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mohan put, puts a, uh, presents a very provocative picture. Uh, he, he, is he right that uh, our politics has not given growth the kind of importance it should? Um, and, you know, coming out of such a resounding mandate, there is a clear pathway over the next five years uh, for the government of India, uh, which the, uh, led by the BJP. So how is the current political movement thinking of the challenge that confronts the Indian economy? Uh, but also, uh, uh, if you could speak to some of the questions of inequality, the environment, all of which come together, I think, in creating a new compact for what growth should look like for the future of India. First of all, thanks to MR and India's Pura for inviting me here. It is really a wonderful experience and I wish I could have spent more time here for tomorrow also. Uh, I am not an economist, uh, so I will give a political answer. Uh, we need the, which is why we have the economists and the politicians and, uh, together. See, most of the baggages which we have carried out in the last five years, especially with respect to the bad loans and PAs, which are really becoming a stranglehold of Indian economy, is uh, the kind gift of previous government. Let us not uh, deny that. Ninety percent of the bad loans, which are now going into insolvency, is because of mismanagement and favoritism done by previous government between, especially the second part of the UPA. And we are still suffering a lot because of it. But uh, when we say about the big reforms, it doesn't mean that only opening the economy for uh, foreign investors. It does mean it has a big role in it. But the fact that the people who were at the bottom of the pyramid, who didn't have any access to technology, any access to the system, or a systemic financing were given an opportunity to be a part of it by simple schemes like uh, zero balance account which now have more than 300 million people uh, beneficiary of it connecting their all the benefits with the other account and digitalization which has enhanced tremendously the digital transactions in India these are also some of the big transformations that India is witnessing uh, again uh, through the trinity of uh, what Prime Minister says uh, or Jan, Jandan account, Aadhaar and mobile through which we have actually bypassed the landline phone revolution which has witnessed in the western world people are directly using mobiles for transfer of money so these are some of the fundamental reforms that have been taken place in the last five years. My limited understanding is that uh, current slow growth is a part of cyclical. Some systemic changes are needed and I am sure the government will do it uh, and is doing it even yesterday. Some of the changes have been announced by the finance minister. So rest assured we will uh, be at the trajectory of 7, 7.2% 7, growth very soon. Uh, but coming back to what I am trying to say that in last five years, what this government has done is something which was not addressed in the last 60 years. Uh, and it will show a very long term impact in not only the months and years to come, but also in the decades to come. And 1991 path of reform is now accepted by any political party. There is a big consensus about it and for that we need to give a due credit to then Finance Minister Mr. Manmohan Singh and Prime Minister Narsian Rao. And uh, that path has continued irrespective of who is in the uh, ruling, ruling party. But the next set of reforms doesn't have to be only at the big bang reforms which will attract uh, IMF, World Bank and the big investors, but also they need to be equally be associated with or connected with the people who are at the bottom of the pyramid. And unless we do that, uh, we
we might have a good catchy headlines in the big newspapers, but the living of the common man may not change a lot. That was also failure of some of the things that have happened in the past and we have learned both economic lessons as well as political lessons that good economics doesn't always <laughs> have good politics. And uh, the success of this government is that it is doing good balance of it and we are convincing people that uh, this is the right path and the results in May 2019 shows it. So, in other words, Mr. Chakmale, what your sort of positioning is to use the government's uh, uh, vocabulary, the ease of living creates a foundation for, uh, uh, for future growth and that's where the focus is. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, if I may just provoke you uh, on, on, on two things. One, ease of living as it were. Uh, requires uh, a significant amount of public expenditure and that public expenditure does have to also come from uh, a, a, a much much more revitalized economy so how are you balancing these two concerns um, and the second question you said you say that the 1991 pathway in some ways is uh, there's a political consensus there is but at the same time, there have been growing concerns and questions rather uh, on whether or not India is looking to further open up its economy. Uh, how does that balance out with import substitution and the rise in tariffs? So could you tell us, could you say a little bit about the policy thinking there? I think uh, one has to balance between the opening of the economy and the protection of the domestic industry. There is no uh, duality about it. Uh, even though there is apparent contradiction. Let us take the example of what we actually in the email about the RCEP mm -hmm. negotiations that have been just concluded two days back. Uh, now the big pool in the RCEP is China. Uh, and we have a 50 million or plus 58 billion dollars trade deficit with China where there is a big opaque system uh, and there are so many non-tariff barriers in China. I, uh, coincidentally, I was in China with a big BJP delegation just two weeks back. And when we raised this issue of the trade deficit, Chinese said, suggested us that, you know what, Bollywood movies are becoming very famous in China. So why don't you bring many Bollywood movies to reduce trade deficit? <laughs> so, <laughs> not in so many terms, but this was their suggestion. So Bollywood movies won't be able to reduce trade deficit. The real juice is in the pharma sector, the real juice is in the service sector, IT services. And there they are still not willing to open the economy. So these are some of the practical issues when we deal with the uh, reducing trade barriers, etc. Uh, and there is no unanimity. I accept it that uh, some industries are uh, advocating for opening of the economy, some industries are advocating for more restrictions and a very classical example is the steel industry where uh, the steel producers in India say not to open it and uh, stop dumping of steel from China while the consumers who are the small industries uh, they say that if I am getting a better raw material, a cheaper raw material, why can't I use it from China? So this dichotomy does exist and we have to balance it out. But uh, I again will say that we will do it. Uh, we won't be able to manage the interest of everyone, but we will manage, uh, try to manage the interest of maximum people and also see at the same time the growth is on the right trend. Professor Kapoor, you've been keenly watching uh, India's politics, its economy, and the, the many shifts that have been taking place in India. Um, as uh, Mr. Jyoti Male, in some sort of laid out uh, the policy thinking or the political thinking for, for the, you know, what the next critical steps for the Indian economy should be. And there seems to be some consensus uh, that the ease of living foundation needs to be strengthened uh, as we make our way through the growth trajectory, combined with this tricky balancing act uh, that we just spoke about. What are your observations on how this government has been doing we are now in the first 100 days, the honeymoon as they say is uh, now coming to an end. Uh, so, so could you give us some insights into what you think has worked, uh, what are the big successes and the big challenges uh, that need to be focused on uh, as we move forward. So 
So I think I'll start with the successes. I think there are three in my mind stand out. One is, and it's not that just this study, but it accelerated in the past uh, uh, which is in a sense, I think, without consciously laying it out, we have adopted a China-like development strategy in the following way. We have really strengthened connectivity in our country. Physical, roads, highways, mobile, optical fiber cable now, gas grids, electricity grids, air connectivity. We have increased connectivity between business and government through the GSC. We have increased connectivity between people and the government through our country. So we have created a platform for markets to work better. That's what the China did. The second thing I think, and with this government was sure, was we've been able to implement public programs at scale. Well, so if you take a program like, like Ujwala, which is the gas cylinder scheme, we have managed to enroll so 18 million households. Uh, Swaj Bharat, yes, there are issues with these schemes, but in terms of really doing this across tens of millions of people of households in very rapid periods of time, that's unprecedented by Indian standards. A third thing I think it would be fair to say, and this there's no firm evidence, but there's a general perception that the corruption in the central government has gone down. I think these are fairly uh, uh, tangible. Uh, <coughs> I think I have some considerable worries as well. One is we are facing not just a but I think not just that, we are also facing a structural slowdown. Uh, and I think the heart of this and the root of this lies in the financial sector. And in addition to almost no export growth, uh, the investment side, the investment collapsed. Without investment, how do you make it? The second thing is agriculture has stagnated, and agriculture is the base still for the maximum number of people of employment. Uh, and the third, as Rakesh was talking about, is that human capital from primary to and that's frankly a 75 or whatever you know, the problem, and this still is in that sort of urgency. I would say that, you know, my worries is that, if, see, sometimes when there's a problem, the first thing is, do you recognize the problem? So in the last CEL, which our Rules of Revolution wrote a paper, uh, instead of looking at the message, we attack the messenger very, very severe. Uh, and frankly, the evidence since then has shown he was more right than wrong. The second thing which worries me is the quality of expertise in the finance ministry, the army, is really at an all-time low. I have never seen our core economic ministries as poorly technically staffed as I do now. And I think part of that lies in something that has puzzled me, is that we have begun to equate disagreement and dissent with <laughs> disloyalty. Uh, and that's puzzling for the following reason. That this government is the first government since 1984 that has a majority on its own. So it should feel very secure. It should feel, it should be much more big-hearted. There's a word in Hindi called Parapan. You have majority, the opposition is in disarray, there's no opposition. And yet any criticism it is a very thin skill. And after all, you learn only when you have a pandemic stage, you take advice from your and of course you decide. But if you decide that every criticism is somehow an act of disloyalty, then it will stifle debate. And if you start to debate, then it's harder to learn. <laughs> I think what I've found more puzzling, given the majority, is the government has been bold in politics, but not as bold in the economy. 
you know, what most, I work on the Indian state, you know, the Indian government, when you combine federal, state, and local, is one of the smallest governments in the world per capita. Yet, one third to 40 percent of all parts of government have vacancies. You can look at it in the police, you can look at it in the IIT faculty, you can look at it in the regulators, you can go down to the district and the BPO's office, every part that I've been able to document. There is no talk at all of administrative reforms. We last had administrative reforms in the late 1960s. And India has a structure of society, of economy, that is completely different since then. And same thing on, I mean, a big part we realize is the financial sector. Uh, the problem began with banking, and Mr. Vijay is absolutely right. This was a pernicious legacy of the UPA government. But this government has had five years to deal with it. When financial institutions <coughs> don't deal with it with a complete full force, that poison will eat you up. And it has been eating up India. And that boldness for some reason, I, given the majority, given the lack of opposition, I'm not very sure I understand why it's not there. Thank you, Rivish, for a very important laying out of the present moment. Now, Simon, if I can just come back to you on two uh, follow-up questions from uh, what uh, Devesh said. One was, to, you know, given your historical experience with one of India's most uh, uh, credible and independent institutions, the IBI, uh, how do you see, uh, how do you interpret some of the debates that are currently uh, 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 underway about uh, both the credibility, the autonomy, and the role of the RBI actually uh, in, in engaging with the current economic um, and another important question, you've, you've been at the uh, forefront, I think, of an important radical shift that the that, that India took. Uh, and, and it's now become commonplace to say it takes a crisis for governments to reform. And it's not just about, it's not just about India, you know, uh, uh, the political science and development theory across the world keeps reminding you of this. Uh, is that really true? What is it that is stopping uh, us for, uh, uh, as a nation uh, from, uh, in, in a current context where we can take bold political moves but are not being able to take bold <coughs> radical economic shifts uh, given the current political dynamics? Your, your, your quick thoughts. Well, let me first say that I hate to say it, but I agree with everything the witch said. <laughs> it's not usual that two economists can agree with. <laughs> I couldn't even find something, anything to disagree with it. Uh, but in connection to what you just said, a very important point you made was a two connected important point. One, the, that um, one of the ways I put slightly differently, but the same point actually, that the first round of reforms starting in 1991 were essentially to empower the private sector, free from government control, to do what it can do best. What we've forgotten in doing this is that you also have to empower the public sector in all its aspects. From the central government, the state government, the local governments, uh, public authorities of all kinds, to empower them technically and otherwise to do what they have to do. Not to interfere in the private sector, but to at least support the private sector. And there's been very little discussion <coughs> on understand, not just within the government, but outside as well. And it's partly because what the has said, which is that people have very little understanding and appreciation of how weak the government health system is in India. Both in terms of numbers, people won't believe you in that because people have a system loaded in the bureaucracy. It's just plain wrong. The Indian Foreign Service, for example, is smaller than the Singapore Foreign Service, for example. So that's a very, very important point. But on top of that is the issue of confidence. And then coming back to the reform, um, he's absolutely right that the whole governmental system of today between the central government and the central bank put together is probably the weakest it has been in terms of economic confidence technocracy in the last 50 years. And what this brings me to the, the your question in terms of that, see, in 1991, 1991 when the crisis took place, I would say there were at least 20 uh, people in the government below the political level 
that is in the technocracy among economists, among advisors, also I have civil servants and result scientists, who could actually work together. And we did, it's actually incredible how we all worked together absolutely seriously. There was also a higher level at the Prime Minister's office level, a Committee on Economic Reform, Steering Committee on Reforms, which met every Thursday for five years, every Thursday for five years. And then bringing in everyone to do what we did in 1996 and um, The situation today is, I think, serious enough, particularly with the idea that, look, we've done it before, we now have the power, the political power, the stability to do what we want for the next five years, maybe ten years. But to do that, to know what to do. First thing to recognize, again, as Dimitri said, that it is a serious problem. It is not secular. And it's not, and I'm not being a political point, because as I said, things have been down since not 2012. Yeah. Yeah. And they've just been going down. And it is, as again, we said, investment is down. And one of the key problems is, for some reason, financial savings are down. You can't invest and grow. And yes, I'm not financial savings. I've done a fair amount of work on this, but I have to say I don't understand what is the matter. And again, I would say it's only at the government level where you have all the data. And you can then put minds together and find out what is happening. How do we increase financial savings in the government? How do we put them to work both in the private sector and the public sector? And to the extent the government now, as we said, has the capacity and the ability to actually implement what it wants to implement. That if it therefore does this at a high level, so A, this is a problem, first diagnosis, then financial can actually do it. It can do it if it wants to do it. But I, I, I would say with some regret and sadness that one doesn't see that focus on the economy and the need for growth. Now, finally, to your question of Reserve Bank, um, I joined the Reserve Bank in 2002. Prior to that, I had been a government, not in the central bank. So I was an income and one thing I, I've been over seven years, one thing I came to appreciate is the rock solid institution is a bank. And they've been there since 1935. And it's built up a reputation of their sagacity, integrity, etc. Um, and uh, I have to say, I say, you know, today it's very odd for a central bank. Between the government and the government today, there's no economics. Not one, not one that government and governors today. Again, this has never happened before since 1935. There is a vacancy, hopefully, will fill soon. Uh, but you need that strength, that, that technocratic strength. Um, and uh, given that the financial sector problems are severe, banking <coughs> and VFC is now, that you need an absolutely seamless working in the government and the reserve bank, the highest level, we saw that the is saying we have to do it quickly. We can't keep saying last five years, six years, seven years. Look again, look in the future. This is what we're going to do today to solve this financial problem so that banks can start lending soon. Thank you. I think we are uh, completely out of time, although I would have liked to ask you to give a quick response. Yeah, I will just give one line huh? and uh, Somehow the impression has been created that unless there is a reserve bank governor imported from US, the Indian economy is not in good hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think those, that was the answer. So, and those uh, have practically no stake because they have their secure position back home. They can always. And what those people have done when UK2 was giving loans left, right, and center, taking cuts. So basically, efficient doesn't mean defective. Let us be very clear about it. And the political leadership, that is what matters at the end of the day. And that is what India is looking for. Well, All other things, no, no. It's a big no, no, no. It's a big no. No, no, no. It's a big no. No, no, no. It's a big no. No, no, no. I will make a wonderful statement. No, no, no. Let me. No, no. Let me be very clear again. The Newton's consensus, we have destroyed it. We are very proud of it.
out of it. 20 people have gone and reached 10 more goals. I think we are. From the system. Unless that happens, the system will not become accountable to the people where we stand for. We are not here to be accountable to some big opinion maker, some columnist, some big newspaper. We are here to be accountable to a common man of India and that is what we are doing. I think in this, this conference.